Hello, Ben Edgington. How are you? Hey, Superfizz. I am very well, thank you. And how are you? You're looking tanned after East Denver. Was it sunny? <laughs> it's not sunny. I, I, uh, I actually stood in a line in 12 degree weather for three hours at 5 a.m. because I didn't want to be late to Shelling Point. Uh, and it turns out I probably could have showed up five minutes before and been just fine. But <laughs> it's, it was a great event. Yeah, you're a proper enthusiast. Nice one. Yeah. Well, I, so uh, funny thing, the shelling point, I, I had, I, I may have um, exaggerated it in my mind. And I'm like, if if I don't go to the shelling point, then am I really part of the process? Uh, I really over-dramatize, dr dramatize? <laughs> I don't know, dramatize. Yeah, whatever. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Hey, so I wanted to say something. I, I, you, I can't tell you. I've had like ten comments that are like, "Fizz, hang your damn pictures up." So I did actually hang my pictures up, and then my friend Daniel Bendorf, he was like, "Hey, can I sponsor you?" And I was like, "No." And he's like, um, "He, I don't know if how oh, that that sign says we are layer zero." And he's like, "Can I can I buy an ad that says we are layer zero and put it in your room?" And I was like, "Yeah." So I have now I am officially a shill now. I'm also a shill for get Poet. Uh, nice. But anyway, I, I just I wanted to point that out because I'm I'm really grateful that uh, some people appreciate the work. Uh, and so it, it just kind of makes my day. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> Good. Um, right. Do you want to leap into the uh, what's yeah. new to thing? Are you gonna put oh, it up on screen I, yeah, like, I share. like yes. we did last time? Oh. I actually uh, I'm I'm a continual improver. Let me figure out how to, uh, my mind has totally forgotten how to use Zoom. Um, so I believe in constant improvement. And so I have, uh, so there's probably gonna be a black spot. Oh, that didn't happen. Okay, um, I went through and I highlighted things that I wanna make sure we hit, um, but I don't want that to take you away from anything <laughs> that you want to bring up because you, you already know it, you wrote it, you know it so much better than I do. Um, I just didn't want to, like get hung on trying to 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 find stuff so uh what's new in eth2 25th february 2022 edition 88 congratulations mm. <laughs> thank you so much I, lucky edition are you familiar with uh back to the future uh yeah uh remind me so it's um uh, a movie probably from 1988 uh but the time machine needs to travel 88 miles an hour oh uh, yeah to travel in time. So it's, it's one of my favorite numbers for that reason. <laughs> nice one. Uh, so Danny Ryan at East Denver, um, absolutely awesome talk. Uh, any thoughts? Uh, it was great. You, you were there, you were uh, in the audience for that bit or did you catch well, up later? I, I, I left before the crowd got huge. Uh, I left East, East Denver. Um, mm. I actually flew back on Friday morning um, because I, in my mind, like I'm really there to meet people and I can watch talks online, um, yeah. and, and to kind of reduce my chances of COVID, I thought it would be best to come back before it got crazy. And, and I missed Danny. Like I've really been looking forward to meeting him in person, but this <laughs> talk was, um, one of his greats. I, I think it's going to go down on the books mm. as, uh, as a top 10, uh, Ethereum talk. And he's just a, such a great uh, ambassador for the whole thing. I mean, we are super blessed with uh, how he landed on the scene of um, ETH2. I mean, he was active uh, in the Ethereum Foundation. He put together um, EIP 1011, which was a, a specification for proof of stake, doing it the old way, yeah, the, yeah. Um, uh, the serenity way run by a contract on the uh, ETH1 chain. Um, and uh, championed all of that. And, you know, I felt I met him first in Berlin in mid 2018, which was the point at which we basically just trashed that design and said, right, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're starting with a blank sheet of paper. <laughs> and I, I, I really felt for him, but um, Danny is awesome. And he has taken the whole project in hand um, and is just super uh, brilliant to getting everybody organized, but uh, also presenting. I just love listening to him. Podcast presentations, I'll, I'll listen all day. Yeah, he. Um, as far as brilliant, humble leader go, leaders go, he is uh, top tier. And I, uh, he's, he's one of those people that uh, I, I look, how do I say, like, I don't, I don't really have icons, 
because uh, I feel like that's that's misguided. Your icons are going to fall. Um, <laughs> but if I did, Danny would be one of them. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have him. I hope yep. everyone checks out this talk. Um, I just posted it on eStaker this morning, on Reddit eStaker. Uh, and definitely um, a contender for best hair in, in crypto. <laughs> And best quads. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, um, there's 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 a video out there somewhere of him uh, doing handstands out, uh, outside his house. Oh wow! <laughs> Everybody's gonna go stalk Danny now. Um, yeah, so we're 45 minutes in, and we got to the first sentence in. What's <laughs> <laughs> um, and so Preston was was there? I I also didn't see Preston. I've, I've met him before, but um, so just for, sort of going back to this idea that. Uh, ETH2 is a thing, and, and I, I'm, I'm sort of, while I'm still in the middle, um, I'm still comfortable with ETH2 as a concept. I don't, I don't think we should really, I don't think it's an argument that's worth arguing. It's, it's a thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to over, um, over egg this one. Uh, let, let, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this next one, it, it's, it's hard not to take it as a joke. Um, mm. because someone put a lot of time into writing an academic paper about a terrible, terrible uh, slashing fault in the beacon chain. Uh, and what? how did it turn out? Uh, well, it turned out to be completely bogus. So uh, the data that they were using was just not the correct data. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of extraordinary. Um, and... The, the bit you highlighted uh, a bit lower down, uh, I am really puzzled by this approach that um, kind of looks to leap out from behind the bush and say, aha, gotcha. Yeah, um, yeah we found a, a serious flaw that breaks your entire protocol um, and we didn't discuss it with you. We just published it to the world. Uh, is very odd, I think. I mean, I, I spent seven years in postgraduate academia. I kind of know how it works. It's not called the ivory tower for nothing. Um, but we do have really healthy relations with um, a whole bunch of academia in, in, in Ethereum. I mean, really strong relationship with Stanford over cryptography and some other stuff. Um, we've got, um, we, we talked last time about the guys who are looking at the consensus mechanism and publishing some, um, you know, attack vectors against uh, the way we do consensus. And the, these are healthy relationships. They discuss the results with us before going public. They, there's a two-way dialogue. Um, and, you know, we, we'd never seek to squash anybody's results or, or anything. You know, people, don't, academics don't need to fear engagement with, with Ethereum. You know, we, uh, we love it. But, um, but this was really odd, just these two guys who uh, published this paper claiming that there were, what, 478 slashing violations that happened on the beacon chain. Uh, up till last August, and we hadn't detected them. We'd only detected like 20% of the actual slashings um, that, that had occurred. Um, and that would have meant that, first of all, that our slashing detection was just not working, um, and um, that people could get away with bad behavior on the beacon chain and, and go unpunished. Um, it also meant that one of our own validators, they identified one of our techie team validators as one that should have been slashed, and that was scary. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, Pretty far to tech. Yeah. yeah, yeah, indeed. But, um, you know, by the time I woke up in the morning, it was all over. I mean, it all kicked off about 2 a.m. my time, and the Australians were all over it and um, basically yeah. um, looked well, into a bunch. Apart, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they looked into a bunch of these alleged events. And when we looked at the actual on-chain data from actual beacon nodes, that they were just not there. Um, so, and um, uh, Buddha, I think, from um, Beacon Chain uh, quickly identified an issue with their indexing. It's a bit subtle, but um, we, we needn't go into it. But uh, yeah, uh, and it, it just, the lesson learned is, you know, they should have just run this bias last September or whenever they, they first discovered it. And just said, look, guys, there's something weird here. Um, do you want to give a comment? And we could have saved everybody a whole lot of time. Yeah. Uh, so much of, of their effort that went into exploring a bug that, yeah, I mean, so, so many different angles on this. I like, I wonder, was it FUD? Was it possible market manipulation? Is it um, maybe they're, they're fans of, of, a, of a different platform? Um, 
I almost wish, and I have, I have I haven't followed them, but I hope they would come back and say, well, you know, this is this is how it happened, um, because it definitely is something uh, we'd like to prevent in the future. Um, yeah, but, there's um, if these were real, these 478 slashings, that's 20k worth uh, dollars worth of um, slashing reports there. So you know, the, the the one who submits them on chain would would benefit to. Uh, with uh, twenty thousand dollars worth of um, ether uh, at the time, so um, <laughs> you know there's one way to prove that if they're if they're real or not. Flash them, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. um, the merge is coming. Um, mil the kiln v two merge spec is out. Um, yeah, another milestone. I mean, it's. Um, we're just iterating uh, slowly, just tying up a few loose ends, um, uh, adding some lessons learned from the Kiln V1 uh, testnet. Um, nothing really very exciting at all uh, in this one. It's um, nothing consensus related. It, it's just uh, upgrades a couple of things. Yeah, and so uh, a lot of a lot of end users, a lot of home stakers who maybe don't keep up with this passionately. Um, may not be aware of the need to um, run a local execution client um, for the merge. And that's because of the new engine API. Um, I've said it 50 times. Um, would you mind repeating that, <laughs> the idea behind that? Yeah, uh, so effectively when you're running after the merge, uh, although architecturally we've got two nodes, you've got a consensus client, uh, an ETH2 client, and you've got a, um, uh, an execution client, an ETH1 client, logically they're just one node, right? They, I mean, for historical reasons and for convenience and because the software is already there, they are two independent components, but actually on the network, um, they are one node. And they, they cooperate together and they're bound somewhat tightly together by this engine API. And so if you want to run a node post-merge, an ETH2 node, it will comprise of two components which you, you should run together. Your, you know, your, your Teku or your Prism or your Lighthouse or your Nimbus or whatever on the one side. And on the other side, your, your Geth or your Besu or your Nethermind. And all those combinations should, should work, but you need to run both. I spent a lot of time worrying that some people will just miss this message, but mm. historically, um, there's you know always been one percent of people who didn't get it. Historically, people tend to get up to speed with these things, so mm. um, I imagine we'll be fine, right? Yeah, I, I mean your node just won't work after the the, the merge, so I mean you'll you'll find out fairly quickly if if uh, yeah. you're able to participate in the network or not. I mean you you're not going to be able to attest to anything. Uh, at the moment, if you're not connected to an ETH1 node, then you can't uh, produce blocks, or, or you know, you um, you're in danger of losing blocks, and that's very infrequent. That might be only two or three months uh, interval if you're running one validator, um, so you might not notice. Uh, but post merge, you, you're not going to be able to do any attestations. Let, never mind uh, block proposals if you, if you're not running both. So pe people will will notice very quickly, um, and I I, I want to just flag this and put a marker in this because I want to come back to this when we uh, talk a bit later about, about something else. Um, the So this heartbeat thing, which is the middle point here, um, is something we've put in, uh, which was one of the inferior engineers uh, actually suggested it, um, which is we will, as people upgrade their clients, their, their consensus clients before the merge, this will become operational and it will check if you've got a local ETH1 node that's correctly configured for merge stuff. And if you haven't, it will warn you uh, rather noisily. So um, that will help to uh, encourage people to, to, to be ready. Oh, cool. great. Um, so anyone who has seen these trackers must love them. Uh, that's my requirement. <laughs> uh, the Kiln tracker just kind of gives an update about where everyone is. Of course, Teku is leading the pack into milestone two. Um, any thoughts here? Well, progress. Um, yeah. It looks like a lot of milestones to go, but it's it's not it's not far away. I mean, we're crunching through them um, and we can run. So the kiln V2. So the plan is to put the um, public kiln V2 test net, make it available uh, 
in the next day or two, I think. Um, oh, really? So, uh, yeah, uh, not all. So not all clients need to be at milestone two. We've sort of found a workaround for that. So it will be um, running in the next couple of days, and there will no doubt be the uh, full slew of explainers and uh, and everything. I mean, it'll be very similar to joining the original Kiln Network. Uh, yeah. We will shut down the original Kiln Network in due course. I don't know what the plan is for that, but people will will be encouraged to join Kiln V2. Um, and it really needs putting through its paces. So, you know, deploy your dApps, um, deploy your infrastructure, run it, send transactions, try and break it. Um, because this is the last one before we start to get really real. This is the, the last kind of dedicated, um, encapsulated testnet. After that, we start forking the existing Ethereum testnets like uh, Roxton or Rinkeby or whatever. Um, and, uh, and then... Um, and it's becoming very real at that point. Awesome. Uh, so ETH Staker and POAP definitely plan to put POAPs um, in the wallets of anyone who runs a Kiln validator. Um, I, you know, having been through so many test nets, uh, well, I, I guess you know, there have only been a few public test nets this round. Uh, Kintsugi is, is the, the mm. biggest one so far. You kind of get test net fatigue, uh, <laughs> but this is, this is it. This is uh, something mm. that ETH Staker plans to drop everything and do some intro videos as soon as it's, as soon as Kiln Public launches. So uh, I'm excited about that. Yeah, and th this is the one I think if you if you want some practice about what it looks like running post merge, you know this this is the one. Um, you, you, you probably want to uh, you know get familiar running your um, uh, your execution client uh, uh, and your and your consensus awesome. client combo on this one. And the other big checklist, uh, this is something else that uh, we all want to look forward to. Look at all of those checked boxes. Yeah, uh, until we get down to testing, it's pretty much done. Um, the, you know, the tiny things which are not checked off yet. The, the, between now and merge is all about testing. Sure, great. Um, let's see, kiln. Uh, yeah, so sooner than I expected it really. I, and I guess I, it's, on one hand, I expected it mid-February. On the other hand, I expected it, you know, things never come that soon. So it's nice to know we are um, a few days away. Yep. Uh, peep and eat, what did I, oops, sorry. So yeah, this is a- uh, uh, Yeah, so the Ethereum calculators, yeah, yeah. So uh, they do a recording. You can join the recording if you ping Pooja, she will uh, give you the Zoom and you can join and do interactive Q&A, but they tend to, uh, record and then put it up on the uh, Ethereum Cat Herders channel. Uh, I haven't seen, this is not out yet, it's not recorded yet, but uh, I'll put the recording in the next edition. And um, this this will be probably a bit technical. This is Marius and Parry talking about running the test nets and uh, about what they've been doing with the Gurley network, just doing a copy of it and replaying all the transactions that are happening on Gurley uh, on that. And I must say, one of the great things recently, Parry is another superstar. Uh, he's fairly recently joined the Ethereum Foundation, but he's basically taking the full load of um, running the test nets and infrastructure. I mean, he's a he's a DevOps superstar, and he's just kind of automated everything. It's uh, takes so much load off the uh, individual teams. He's also been very uh, supportive of ETHstaker. So um, mm. anytime we've asked for something, and obviously we're giving back to the community too, but he's been incredibly responsive and supportive. So uh, thanks, Perry. Um, Rocket Pool reached 1%. That's a great milestone. Yay! Yay. I love it. Yeah. Um, I love it. And so, yeah, I, I obviously I talk about Rocket Pool 24 seven. It's trustless, open source, permissionless, decentralized staking on Ethereum. It's fractional staking. So um, that's that's great. Um, you had mentioned, so I, I did read this NASDAQ article um, by Sephiroth. Um, so I want to I want to run this thought by you and, and just mm. kind of get you to bounce it off of you. I feel like services like all nodes re-centralize the thing we're trying to decentralize. <laughs> is that is that a fair perspective? Yeah, it's a bit uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Having um, service providers run rocket pool nodes. Um, yep. I, I don't have a lot to say about it. I can't really add to your take. <laughs> yeah, okay. And it's, it, it's not, I, I'm, I'm funny because like I support providers. I support mm. all nodes. 
I just, uh, you know, my, my ultimate goal is network decentralization. Yeah. Uh, and so I, it's I was a problem. really on the fence about that one. It's the problem with permissionlessness, right? I mean, yeah. you know, by design, the whole thing is permissionlessness, uh, is permissionless, <laughs> my turn. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you can't stop it. I mean, so it, it, um, where there's an opportunity, people will, will take advantage of it. I mean, I, um, I think all nodes are superb, but, you know, that's not the point. The point is that, you know, there are potentially big players um, yeah. in, in Rocket Pool as well. Um, yeah spin up your own nodes, and, use individual nodes. And where you say you can't stop it, I'm, I'm kind of, currently I'm in the school that we can stop it, that layer zero is the social network that prevents centralization. Uh, and so that, that's sort of the, the thing I'm working on right now. We'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> client diversity on the beacon chain. Oh, so pools.aviz.cloud. I am mm. so, so thankful and appreciative. Uh, you know, we spent, literally months not having a good picture of um where the client diversity problems were um you know i'm i went to old people's houses and banged on their doors and demanded that they switch from prism to teku uh and they cried and it was terrible i'm making this up but eventually you know through this data through thanks to ox and viz and um michael sproul we know now that it is primarily uh, the culpability of um, Kraken and Coinbase. And mm. we do have some public commitments from them now to make changes. So that's exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to put up the uh, the site, the pools.invis.cloud? Uh, see what we got. There's a lot uh, of red. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Coinbase and Kraken. Lido is, um, while they are a very large provider, they're nearing 20%. And that's, some, that's a, mm. something we want to slow down. Um, their client diversity is beautiful. So shout out to Lido for that. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'd be good to see a status update on their progress towards um, decentralizing their, their, their whole uh, infrastructure, because that was a big thing a few months ago. Um, I'd like to know how they're getting on. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so right now when, when it comes to providers uh bitcoin swiss is is really if, if you have to choose an exchange and i don't want you to stick with an exchange <laughs> but if you have to um bitcoin swiss is my go-to for the moment oh yeah and running uh teku throughout um a shout out for all nodes as well they're running teku oh good <laughs> uh let's see um jim and robert and attestant uh vouch multi-node validator do you want to say anything about that? Uh, love Attestant, just really innovative um, and uh, active in, in the space, always trying to improve things, make things better. Um, Jim is uh, is brilliant and, and really uh, um, throws himself into things. So they came up with this um, validator client. Now, in E2, validator is very simple piece of software. Um, the beacon node is where all the complexity is. The validator basically just signs stuff when when it's told to sign stuff. Um, but what Attestant did was come up with Vouch, which is a sort of beacon node agnostic validator client, and it can speak to multiple beacon nodes. So you can have a Prism running, a Teku running, an Imbus running, a Lighthouse running, uh, a Lodestar running. I don't think maybe they don't support Lodestar yet, but um, Nimbus is supported as of last week. Um, and what it will do is when it's time to make an attestation, it will consult the uh, beacon nodes and check that they have the same view of the network and it can you know, choose a majority view of the network. So if one of them has forked off because of a bug, then it won't attest to something which is uh, on a fork. When it's time to make a block, um, it can it use heuristics to say, what's the most profitable block in this situation? You know, Which one should I choose? Um, do all the clients agree on their view of the network and so forth? Um, it's it's very nice, and you can configure it with rule sets. And that article is is uh, a nice explainer how you can um, for um, attestations you can prioritize non Prism clients. So uh, it's it's a nice it's a nice uh, and there's some subtleties in in the arguments uh, there, but it's a good. Uh, explainer and I think this is what rocket pool are doing a, a lot of or a number of the rocket pool providers uh, sorry not rocket pool um, my bad Lido a number of the Lido providers are uh, running vouch like this which which just helps with robustness yeah I, I think um, 
Vouch is probably a good here now alternative for people who are really obsessed with DVT kind of stuff um, because Vouch is currently available and it does give you that kind of, I don't want to call it, it's not an M, and I, M of N, but it does let you run multiple clients and choose the, the best data to submit. Um, yeah, so. yeah. Testament also has a key splitting thing. I forget what they call it, but you can also split your key into multiple parts in multiple locations and do a reconstruction when it's time time to vote, which is another security. Is that um, public? Uh, yep, yep. It's all oh, okay. um, all open source. It's all on the on the um, either Jim's website or that I can't remember. But yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I Jim has always been very supportive. I look forward to us. Uh, actually, Eastaker has a plan to get with them and demo. Uh, Dirk and Vouch, so I'm very excited for that. Mm. Uh, rated .network. I, I wanted to chat about this too. What, what are your thoughts? <laughs> um, this is a good start. Uh, so it's um, under development, uh, but uh, I've been corresponding a bit with uh, Elias and uh, um, the other guy who's, who's built this. And um, yeah, it's all about surfacing what's actually going on. So mashing up the data. I mean, there are various efforts around this, but this this is quite nice. And the best thing is they've got an API, so you can interrogate the the, the database. Um, the the front end um, is not the most usable yet, but it's showing some good info. Um, and then the API is very flexible, and you can uh, pull down data. So it's relative performance, and there's lots of docs about how the effectiveness rating is um, calculated. So you can compare how different staking pools and services are are doing in terms of running. So you can see Anchor there down, so like two thirds of the way down is like 81.45%, which is typical. Um, Cream.finance is 77%, so, you know, run away. Um, are you are you getting that from Ethereum pools, the, the Twitter? Because I know they, they picked out specifically uh, <laughs> yeah. Anchor and Cream recently. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's consistent, right, with this view of the world, yeah. and it's all on-chain data. Um, I mean, some of identifying who the operators are isn't always all on-chain, uh, though yeah. quite a lot of it is because you can trace back the deposit address, you can see which wallet it came from, and so on. But um, all of the performance information is just on-chain. There's no secret source. Anybody with a node can can dig out this info, but to have it presented um, in an easy to consult format is is a game changer. So. My take on this, and so I do view it as a positive product. Um, I, I, I don't have any, any negative thoughts about it, but I do in some ways wonder if it misses the forest for the trees because the, the forest is, is really just network health. Um, and so network health is more than just uptime and proposals. It really is uh, res resiliency, robustness, mm. decentralization. Um, and so... Um, if there were hypothetically one very centralized provider on AWS and uh, they, they could hypothetically put up 100% effectiveness, um, but that wouldn't necessarily make them the, they, they would be highest rated, but it mm. wouldn't make them the best provider. Similarly, you could have, um, you know, a, a decentralized network of, uh, let's, a, a thousand, 10,000 validators around the world and they're only up 70 percent of the time but they do contribute more to uh network health than that centralized provider uh, does that yeah um i i think it's it, it's a fair point but you know this is just surfacing data right i mean i i and it's a data point and you've brought in some other data points and we need to uh, it's all part of getting a a, a clear picture of um uh, of the whole network yeah. so um i i'm really happy with um surfacing data uh, transparency being able to see what's going on uh, i mean what you mentioned is when the metric becomes the target then uh then we have problems you, you know this yeah. is a problem everywhere right but uh um i think being able to measure my compare the performance of my nodes against you know how the staking pools are doing. I, I, that's great. I love it. So, oh, yeah. yeah. I, you, I think you hit it when the metrics become the target. So, if if the target here is a hundred percent effective rating, regardless of the underlying infrastructure, mm. um, then it's it's a missed mm. target from the outset. So, 
So I think these guys are looking to sort of crowdsource data from you know other setups and things, so that you, we can it can populate as as comprehensive a view of the network uh, as uh, as it can, um, and then encourage people to uh, use the data to to present in creative ways. Do you know anything about this Augur Eth? I know nothing. It's interesting to me. <laughs> Obviously, Augur is the um, prediction market platform that I, I haven't seen a lot of lately. I'm not sure it's still active, but it is still active. I think, but. Mm -hmm. um, I think Baco kicked off a conversation about staking UX, a thing that I love to talk about. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's that's obviously it's in there. What do you got? <laughs> oh, I had, oh, I had a notice. I had a notice, sir. <laughs> uh, so, you know, Tim says, "What do you think the optimal interface looks like?" Um, and I love Little Rocket Man on both of these uh, responses, a stake button, an unstake button. I'm, I'm in favor of that. Um, Tim responds that that's Lido. And no, I, I don't believe that's, that's Lido. Uh, uh, I think we're referring, at least I'm thinking of in this case, solo staking, that solo staking should be that simple, not, not provider-based uh, staking. Um, and then, oh, let me extend that one, one more time and then I will. Uh, and so this is my favorite one. Download the app, connect the wallet, click save, leave the computer on, and click on stake a year later. That is UX as I see it. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly the the tweet that I wanted to kind of like um, come to uh, uh, on on this conversation because, um, and I I got to be really careful about how I put this because I'm going to upset people, right? But I I don't think staking should be that easy. Um, so. I, I need to unpack that because um, the protocol is paying you, right? You're, you're providing a service to the um, protocol. Part of that payment is opportunity cost of the staked ETH, right? You could be getting some um, a return on DeFi from it or something like that. Instead, it's in the ETH2 protocol. But another part of it is the paying you for some activity, for doing something. And that activity is not pushing a button and then pushing another button and then going away and leaving it. Um, that activity is maintaining a node, making decisions like um, which node should I run, which we talked to earlier. So I put the pin in it earlier about we're coming up to a point in time where people have got to make decisions about running ETH1 nodes with their ETH2 nodes. Uh, and you know a bunch of us will need to actually do something about that which is not covered by pushing a button um you need to maintain your client you need to make be present on the discords of your client uh, provider because it's fine when the network's running smoothly now but where you really earn your reward is when something goes wrong right and we saw this on the test notes this modasha test note i've got a po app because i'm a modasha resuscitator right uh, it was hard keeping the thing running was hard we had to update our clients several times we had to know what's going on the um, people running prism at the time were told to update their clients and they were told to not update their clients and you know it it was complicated mm -hmm. and i am worried about people who think oh i can get a nice return let's push this button and go away and forget all about it they're not serving the network they're not earning their money and so um I, I think there should be a little bit of a technical barrier to to staking. And if you don't have that technical barrier, then you know, stake with Rocket Pool because you get the um, you know, use a third party, push the buttons for them. They do have the competence, at least I hope they do. And uh and you are you're, you're running decentralized. And, and so my my rebuttal to that would be like um Complexity is generally engineered away in complex products. Um, so like, you know, my, my Tesla pretty much drives itself. They've abstracted away a lot of the effort of driving it. Um, in the same way, you know, Rocket Pull has abstracted a lot of with, away a lot of the difficulty. The other extreme of that would say, if you're going to run a validator, you have to be able to write a validator client on your, on, on your own and run it. So I need to, uh, you know, pull up a, a, uh, whatever, a, a CLI, write a validator and then deploy it because that's the only way I can contribute to the network. So we have those two extremes. Um, I do agree that there should be some effort involved, 
But when it comes to things that can be engineered away and automated, uh, I do think that there is significant value to that. Um, things like, I, I, I don't believe in four or five years when the network has settled down that we'll be talking about clients a lot. I think that good interfaces will probably have, uh, they'll be able to measure network traffic or hit an API and say, this is, this is the client I should be running right now. Um, but yeah, they're, they're both sides. Um, yep. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how it, uh, uh, how it plays out. My fear is that, is that it continues to increase in complexity and sort of kicks out. Uh, so Filecoin is actually a great example of this. Mm -hmm. Um, I spent two weeks trying to set up a Filecoin miner and just gave up. Like I just, I couldn't do it. Um, and so because of that, I was, I was sort of left out of the Filecoin system. Uh, I, I hope that doesn't happen for people who want to stake on Ethereum. Yeah, I did look at Filecoin and um, I realized I'd have to invest in some serious hardware. So I, <laughs> I ran away. Yeah, I mean, it's finely balanced, right? And I, I don't, and you know, people are going to take a different different views from me, but um, uh, on this, but I I think it is is worth thinking about, right? It's coming back to your layer zero. Ultimately, it is people who are responsible for making this this thing work. And if people are not going to be responsible, they're just going to like press a button and go away. Then um, then it's not going to work. Yeah, fair fair point. Uh, great explainers. <laughs> follow yetek on uh, on twitter if you if you uh, have any inner nerd he is superb he just has um every so few he weeks he'll just put it put down a little thread which is um explain some obscure corner of what's going on in the beacon chain or nimbus and uh, i just love them yes um i haven't read that yet but i i do look forward to reading it uh, Dank Sharding, <laughs> this is what, I guess you were finishing this last uh, recording yeah. before we started, uh, and yeah. I, I know it fried your brain. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to watch it again, but uh, it's important stuff. Yeah, I think um, in the evolving Ethereum roadmap, uh, we it's fascinating how, how it develops. You know, somebody will drop a new idea, and it's just obviously so good that we will, that within a, a couple of weeks... Them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> within a, well, it's such a great name, isn't it? Um, within a couple of weeks, we we you know everybody has said, "Oh yeah, yeah, that makes complete sense. We're going to do it." And um, it happened about the merge. It happened about the roll-up centric roadmap. I mean, it's just sort of um, uh, some ideas are just so it's, obvious. Do you think why why didn't we think of it before? Do, do you do you think about zeitgeist much? Do you is that is that a <laughs> You know, the, the spirit of the times, like th there are so many great minds coming together mm -hmm. on something and sharing information that at some point, someone's going to have the idea that everyone would have eventually come to, but someone yes. got there first. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, the, it shows how sort of futile, you know, that nice, neat three phase roadmap that we had phase zero, phase one, phase two, uh, a, a couple of years ago, four years ago, you know, it made sense at the time, but, you know, it was never going to last because, uh, um you just cannot see that far ahead there's so much um uh good stuff out there and great ideas coming along but if you don't pick a direction and aim and start traveling in that direction you never get yeah. where you're going and you're yeah, yeah exactly that that's the fascinating dynamic about ethereum you've got to kind of build and research alongside each other and they play off each other and uh, um that's one of the reasons i i, I just love being part of this uh so this is something a lot of people are interested in, validator balance withdrawals during Shanghai. Uh, yep. And there, there are a couple ideas around this. Uh, I think the good news is just that uh, by early 2023, people should expect to uh, be able to take gains from uh, their state uh, validators. Yep, yep, uh, definitely. It's uh, basically a non-negotiable at this point that soonish after the merge, six months or so, uh, we will have some, uh, withdrawals in some form or another. So uh, there, there are multiple ways it can be done. That's the current um, conversation, just what what's ergonomically and um, technically the best solution. Uh, now, I did look at this <laughs> and I have no, like, I'm, I'm like, maybe I should just gloss over it because I, I don't even know where to uh, where to begin. 
Uh, yeah, so this is Vitalik looking at inner product arguments. There's an alternative to KZG commitments. This is just a Vitalik thought experiment. I don't think we, we will do this, um, but uh, it's he is incredibly productive. Just amazing what he just sort of pumps out um, off, off the top of his head, seemingly. Um, so yeah, if you want a, um, a primer on inner product arguments, which don't require a, a trusted setup, then uh, then check it out. But I think we will probably end up with the KZG commitment. Can I, can I tell you, occasionally I'm like, okay, Vitalik has written something like this. And I'm like, all right, Fizz, I'm going to buckle down and I'm going to read this and research until I really, really get it. <laughs> no, like it, nah, it, it's not, it's not going to happen. I'm just like, just give up, dude. It's, it's not there for me. <laughs> um, okay. So what is this? Uh, Kiln, the test up is coming up sooner rather than later. Looking forward to, uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to say this week, but possibly. Yeah, it should be. This is what we agreed on Thursday last week at the, um, uh, on the call. Um, so I think Barry said it, it set things up. Uh, it checked with the teams that we'd all done the name changes required and then uh, uh, spin yeah. it up either uh, tomorrow or Wednesday. Looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. um, DevConnect is in April. I, I, did oh, yeah. I hear you're going? I am going to be there. All being well, um, should be there for the week. Yeah, it looks like the pandemic is is giving everyone a break. Um, my family yeah. is is still we're hunkered down, so I won't be crossing the pond. But uh, uh, other world events may prevent some members oh, of yeah. uh, the team uh, joining. Unfortunately, all of European airspace is currently closed to Russian flights. So Mikhail, who is chief architect of the merge, is going to be. Have a, maybe you can take the train. I don't know. So my my sister once took the Trans Siberian Express from uh, um, somewhere near where Mikhail lives to to Moscow, and it it, it literally looked took four and a half days. So <laughs> I don't. Yeah, it may not be worth it, right? Oh, um, we'll see. Uh, hopefully, you can join remotely. Some stuff coming up. Uh, Gitcoin is publishing Vitalik's writings, which is exciting. I, I love. Kevin Owaki and Gitcoin. Everything he does, it's uh, it's just. Have you have you heard his green pill? Um, yeah, I listened to the one with whatever. um, I listened to the one with Vitalik today, uh, and the one with Carl Flush. I listened to yesterday. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, great, really good. They're they're really um, so th th that's where I consider myself. I consider myself in that public goods for decentralization mm. kind of framework. And hearing those just really inspires me to like keep going. It's like it is it is not always rewarding, but it is a good direction. So I, I love what they what they've got going on. Yeah. Green green pill. Was that a was that a term you were familiar with before, or is that something he's invented? I believe he's invented it. Um <laughs> and it's nice. it's based on the uh the, the red and the blue pills, of, yeah, yeah, of course. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> Shout out to Kevin for, for always coming up with a new meme that I won't figure out until a year later. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by that book. I, I hadn't heard about it before. It just popped up on my radar uh, this week. But uh, um, there's also somebody who will be writing some uh, commentary on Vitalik's um, uh, writings, which um, I, I didn't record there, but it's on, on the page. You can, you can pre-register for um, a book. You can donate some eth to pre-register for an nft something going on there it was a bit intriguing because i looked at it and it was 0 0.1337 eth and only one person had done it and they'd got it they'd, they'd got in for much less than that but every time i tried to send less it said minimum is 0 0.1337 so i think they might have fixed something there <laughs> but uh, um, i'm curious about that now um, yeah i thought i'd try and break it but failed so this this leads me to a question, um, and it's it's about another client. I I don't think there's any conflict of interest here, but um, Lodestar is on Ethereum's bug bounty program and mm. uh, Dapplion's uh, SSZ its implementation. I'm curious if or when we should expect to see Lodestar on the launch pad. Is that something that's mm. is it on the horizon, or is it something that's uh, maybe just not a goal? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, our Lodestar is fully mainnet capable. They are running on uh, on mainnet. Um, it's not. I, 
as I understand it from, from the team, it's not their primary focus to be a sort of production staking client. Their primary focus is to uh, provide tooling, um, light client support, which is you know, just super important. Uh, you know, running a light client in the browser that can trustlessly access um, Ethereum uh, data on the network, you know, it basically uh, cuts out Infura. Um, that that's their, their focus. Um, I don't know where they are from a sort of product point of view or, or how that uh, relates to uh, Launchpad or not. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm really excited to see their their full setup guide, and I I think that um, if I can find 32 Ether in, in the couch, I might uh, <laughs> set up a uh, a Lodestar validator. Uh, I I just I'm so interested in it, uh, but I'm also not quite ready. My my standard has always been wait till it shows up on Launchpad before promoting yeah. it. Um, I have a have a chat with the team. They're super approachable. Um, oh yeah, yeah, good folks. Um, all right, I think that's about it. I, I don't I didn't catch it here, uh, but we did give a a POAP for anyone who ran a Kitsugi validator. So if you're listening to this and you you ran a Kitsugi uh, validator, if you if you load that private key um, from your I guess for me, it's in secrets.env. I'm not sure how other people set it up. But if you load the private key from your deposit address into uh, MetaMask, uh, you can then go to uh, is a block scan chat, uh, or you can use the ether scan chat um, and connect with that address. And, and you should have been delivered a, a POAP mint code for that Kintsuki POAP, which I think is is really cool. Th uh, thanks to Wizard of Hex for creating that. and. Uh, <laughs> It's it's great. I like. I love. I love supporting these people who go out of their way to support a testnet. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Good stuff. All right. Um, what's long? Evils of fascism. Yeah. Um, I, I. I almost. I'm trying not to talk about world events, and at some level, I almost feel like it is. Um, it's irresponsible not to talk about them because people are suffering. And if, if we choose to ignore it, then we're part of the problem. Um, but it's mm. also kind of overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I have all sorts of mixed feelings about crypto I I in general, but at the root of it, there is um, something very solid, which is the um, permissionlessness of it. Um, and I, I kind of surprise myself at this stage in my life, you know, that I find I'm very passionate about this, um, that it is about freedom, uh, ultimately. And, um, and, and freedom is a good, um, it can be used for bad, but fundamentally, um, people are better when they are free. And so, yep, I was, uh, it was good to be reminded of all that. There's a lot of noise around, but, you know, uh, ultimately, for me, this is, this is why I crypto. Uh, well, Ben, um, I love doing this with you. Like I said before we started recording, <laughs> sometimes these become a slog, but uh, it, it is actually becoming a highlight of my week. So um, <laughs> that's kind. Yeah, it'd be nice to do this on a couple of leather armchairs with a pint of beer each in a nice old English pub. But uh, yes. one day, maybe one day. <laughs> yes, I look forward to that. Thanks again for your time. All right. Thanks. For this. I never know how to use Zoom. I got to stop recording somehow. Let's find this.